Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Exploring Lifelong Learning Options for the Business Architecture Professional. I'm your host, Mariah Weiss, and on behalf of IIBA, thanks for joining us today. Today's webinar is a public event. It is designed to deliver practical resources for you as you continue to grow your skill set and deliver value within your organization. When you join IABA, you become a member of an international association dedicated to developing and promoting the business analysis profession. Your IABA membership gives you access to a vibrant business analysis community and resources to support your development and career growth. IABA is a nonprofit professional association serving the global field of business analysis, and our goal is to unite a community of professionals to create better business outcomes. As the global thought leader and voice of the business analysis community, IIBA works to maintain global standards for the ongoing development of the practice and certifications. This webinar is brought to you by our IIBA sponsor, Penn State Smeal College of Business. The Smeal College of Business at the Pennsylvania State University offers highly ranked undergraduate, MBA, executive MBA, PhD and executive education opportunities to more than 5,000 students at all levels. SNEAL is among the largest business schools in the United States and is accredited in business and accounting by the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business. Featuring academic departments of accounting, finance, management and organization, marketing, risk management and supply chain and information systems, the college is also home to major research centers in areas such as supply chain management, business to business marketing, corporate innovation, and entrepreneurship, and other disciplines. We would like to thank Penn State Smeal College of Business for supporting IABA and the business analysis community. I would also like to introduce our presenter from Penn State, Dr. Brian Cameron. Dr. Cameron is the Associate Dean for Professional Graduate Programs in the Smeal College of Business at the Pennsylvania State University and is the Founding Director of the Center for Enterprise Architecture in the College of Information Sciences and Technology. Dr. Cameron is also the Founding President of the Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations and designed and implemented the first online enterprise architectures master's program in the world. He has worked on a wide portfolio of companies on a variety of consulting engagements, ranging from large systems integration projects to enterprise architecture planning and design. Dr. Cameron was awarded the NPA Career Achievement Award in 2011 for efforts related to the founding of the Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations, the building of the Center for Enterprise Architecture, and the Associated Service for the Enterprise Architecture Profession. So without further ado, I will hand this presentation off to Brian. Okay, thank you, Mariah. And you can share, my, there we go, or share my screen. And it's a pleasure to be with everybody today. So what I'd like to talk about in the time that we have together, uh, the lifelong earn, learning options that exist today for the business architecture professional and then talk about some of the programs that we've developed at Penn State. We have a wide portfolio of online and resident professional graduate programs and graduate certificates designed to uh, for, for a wide variety of professionals and for a wide variety of career goals and, and levels in the career. So let's get started. If my screen will advance. There we go. So what I'd like to discuss today is uh, kind of the current state and challenges of lifelong learning for business architecture and, and, and business analyst professionals. Um, discuss some of the pros and cons of some of the, the more popular options that are out there today and discuss things that you might want to consider looking for in a learning partner and, and a partner that is there for you for through different uh, stages of your career and an overview of possible options that, that might be of interest that um, we offer in the Smeal College of Business at Penn State. So business architects take a variety of twists and turns in their careers um, to get to that, that business architect, senior architect level. There's no one career path. This is uh, the challenge we face, and you face this in enterprise architecture and other career fields as well. 
there's not well understood, clearly defined career paths. And people typically come into these roles through a variety of twists and turns in their organization. And here's some of those twists and turns. Uh, you might take a more technical path where you're more of a technical architect, uh, and then you might evolve into um, a, an enterprise architect, or perhaps decide that you have more of a knack for the business side of architecture and move into more of a business architecture type role in the organization. And some of this depends on how business architecture is positioned in your, in your particular organization as well. You might take more of a project management role as well. If we look at the other side, where you're going through different type, different layers of project responsibility, might, and you might get exposed along the way to business analysis and business architecture, and decide that that's your calling in life, and then take steps to move in that direction. Um, you might start as a business analyst and and decide that um, a, a business architecture path is a path that you'd like to progress into, and then eventually become more of a senior business architect. Um, but there are other twists and turns that people take, and I think more and more, if you look at how the 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 field of business architecture the discipline of business architecture has progressed over the last several years uh there's a definite trend there's more of a trend now and i'd say based on some of the data that i i see from some of the different professional organizations that, that i'm involved with i'm on the boards of a couple different professional organizations around business architecture uh, the trend there's a definite trend out there where business architects have evolved from their traditional role under enterprise architecture and have moved in many cases to an area of the business, uh, oftentimes strategic planning. I think strategic planning is a natural fit for a strategic business architecture uh, function. Um, and this is kind of our approach to business architecture within the Samuel College of Business, more of uh, business architecture as an enabler of strategy execution. And if you think about it that way, then it, it probably does make sense having tight affiliation or perhaps a reporting relationship to uh, a business function such as strategic planning. But that's not the case in every organization and one size does not fit all. There, there are very good business architects and business architecture groups that's, that reside under enterprise architecture, which might report to IT. That might be the right model for your organization. So again, I don't wanna imply that one size fits all, but that's just the, that's one of the main points of my discussion today is one size does not fit all. So you need to understand where you want to go. Uh, if you're going to stay within the organization you're working now, what are what are the options? How is the, the organization structured around business architecture? How does it view business architecture and plan your career path accordingly? And I, again, one size doesn't fit all. You may have different motivations. Some of you may be looking for a lateral move in your organizations, going from one part, perhaps under an IT related role to a uh, more of a business oriented role um, and maybe moving into um, some a group like strategic planning or another business related function. So you might be looking for more of a lateral move. Some of you might be looking to move up and, and progress within the, the part of the organization you're in now or another part of the organization. You may be um, looking to relocate Maybe you're looking to jump to another organization into uh, a different industry or, an, or another organization within the industry that you're working in now. You might want to explore options. You're not sure what you want to do. So I want to try different things and, and kind of do process of elimination and figure out what I don't want to do first uh, and then back your way into things that, that uh, over time look more and more interesting to you. You might want to totally realign things. Maybe you just, and we see people like this that want to just almost start over. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I thought my career choice, my major in college was what I wanted to do. I've graduated, I've worked in it for a few years, and you know what, this isn't what I really want to do. Um, I really want to make a pivot and realign and move to X or Y. Um, so you, that's, we, we get a lot of people like that, that, that are retooling and, and trying to move into something different. That, and so that's a perfectly valid motivation. Or you might just be looking to learn more and be better at what you're doing now. Um, that's, I mean, we, we get all of these types of people that, that, that come to us. So one size doesn't fit all. So you really need a learning partner that realizes, you know, every, every goal, every learning journey is different. And how do we craft a learning path, a learning plan that works for you and your goals? I did a survey a few years ago with Jeff Scott, some of you that have been in business architecture for a while likely know Jeff. He's a for, former forest um, forester uh, business analyst. He was the chief analyst for Forester Research for a long time. Um, 
he he still speaks um, periodically. He's kind of semi-retired right now, but Jeff is one of the the better thinkers that I've encountered around business architecture, and uh, we remain close friends to this day. But we did a, a survey to to look at some of the needs, the educational needs of the business architecture slash analyst communities, and I found some interesting things. I don't think there was anything necessarily shocking, but it just reinforced some of the things that we had already knew or or suspected. Most business architects have, you know, little or or no formal education in business architecture. There aren't that many particular programs out there, degree programs in business architecture. So like you said, they've come into the field through different twists and turns um, from a variety, wide variety of backgrounds in many cases. And they perceive a lack of high quality development options um, on, on the market today. Uh, the sur survey respondents indicated time, money, shortage of high quality educational offering, and a manager's lack of recognition of business architecture slash analyst value are all presented as significant challenges in furthering their professional development. And more on this study is at, the, at this URL. So if you'd like to read more about it, uh, the slides will be shared with you. You can um, take, take some time and look it over. But so let's build on these findings. You look at some of your options today. Most people, I, I think, start with or look at different types of certificates. And we'll talk about degrees in a second. Within the certificate universe, we have non-credit certificates and four credit certificates. So let's talk about the differences and some of the pros and cons of each. And again, I'm not here to say that one is better than the other. Uh, they are different for different goals. And for some people, the non-credit certificates are the route to go, and for others, the four-credit certificates. So you're, you really need to know where you want to go with your, your career goals and your educational goals to pick what's best for you. So I'm not here to say one is uh, better than the other, but I think you need to understand the differences and the pros and cons of each so that you can make uh, well-informed decisions. So in the non-credit universe, these are typically short courses. Um, maybe, you know, uh, typically one, two, three, um, maybe up to four days in length, typically anywhere from two to three days uh, is the, the norm from what I've seen. Or it could be short, if, uh, that's if it's done in person, uh, it could be short courses through places like Coursera online as well, where you're, you're taking short modules that might be anywhere from a few hours to, you know, typically you know, less than 10 or 15 hours in length, uh, uh, the, but that varies. But there could be, there's a lot of online options and there's some face-to-face -face options out there and, and business architecture, depending on, um, you know, what type of learning environment you're most comfortable with. But they also share some general, uh, the same general ca characteristics. They're either offered by for-profit training companies or through colleges and universities. And you see more of the non-credit stuff, I'd say, uh, in the for-profit space. Colleges and universities do some of this, but uh, not nearly as much as, in my opinion, as the, the for-profit training companies. Um, so the four credit certificates, let's just talk about each at a high level and then we'll talk about which might be better for you. Four credit certificates are offered by colleges and universities, typically over a semester uh, per course. So you may have um, at Penn State, our certificates are uh, typically three or four courses in length. So it will typically take you approximately a year, uh, maybe a little less in some cases, but about an academic year. So that would be a fall and spring um, to complete the certificate. So most courses are 15 weeks in length. And again, typically takes you two semesters to finish. So it's a much longer time frame than the, the few days that you might get for the, the non-credit certificate. So let's talk about which might be better for you. Again, one size doesn't fit all. Um, if you're looking for kind of a quick drill down on a topic, the shorter courses uh, might be the route to go. Um, I, with the non-credit certificates, if somebody's offering you a certificate, um, I would really look at um, what are you getting uh, for that? So what I mean by that, there's a lot of people out there happy to take your money and have you sit someplace or, or go, go online with for a, a day or two with not much with maybe no assessment I, I, i've seen a lot of non-credit with absolutely no assessment on whether you learned anything from the course or no no assessment of what you've done in your career 
and anybody that gives you a certificate and says you're you know some type of certified professional after a few days and a course with no assessment and no assessment of what you've done in your career and what level you are i really look cautiously at those types of providers because i and how how they're viewed um with with credibility and and viewed in your organizations because i i just look very skeptically at the, those types of um models i think you need some assessment you need some evaluation of what somebody's done in their career before you give them some kind of certificate that says they're a you know enterprise architect business architect or other some other kind of professional um, but if you're just looking for kind of a, a quick um get me up to speed on certain topics um the the short non-credit uh, route might be uh, just what you need. Um, for the four credit certificates, much longer time frame. This is much and much more expensive investment uh, in in most cases. So if you're looking to try something with the eye of possibly matriculating into a degree program, and there's so many uh, remote, part-time, online degrees out there today. We have a whole uh, uh, growing portfolio at Penn State. This is a good way to try something, get a micro credential, a grad certificate, and then um, see if you want to continue on and get the full master's degree. So, and if that's your goal, to, to, to have a, a longer educational experience that, that might culminate, culminate into a degree, um, this might be the, the route for you. I would also look for certificates that enable you to go into multiple degrees so if you're not sure what degree you want to go into at a college or university can i go into multiple so i might walk into this thinking i want to want to go into an online mba but then after i've been in it for a little while i realize um an online program and i'm just making this up corporate innovation or entrepreneurship or in uh enterprise architecture or some other more specialized degree might be what i really want to do can i use this certificate as a springboard into any of these programs uh, uh, if I decide that, you know, um, uh, that I wanna go in a different direction than I'm thinking about now. So do, they, do you give me that flexibility? Um, four, four credit certificates uh, can be good to give you a deeper dive into a topic as well. So if you're not just looking for kind of a quick, um, uh, a, a real quick uh, jolt on a topic like you might get with non-credit, if you want a, a longer, more in-depth experience since they are typically over 15 weeks you typically get into a, many more topics at greater depth and there will be assessment involved in these courses um that, that's another reason why you might want to consider four credit certificates but again one size does not fit all I, I would just really look into the 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 organization that's offering the training or the the degree and make sure that you know you're getting what you're what you hope to get out of it and that you're getting um you know respected and recognized credential at the end. Okay, with degree programs. So, um, you know, obviously colleges and universities for the most part provide degrees. We do non-credit education as well, but if you look at, you know, obviously where most of our students are enrolled, it's in, um, you know, undergraduate or master's or doctoral degrees. Um, and in many career fields today, the university degree is strongly suggested or, or even required. Uh, I would argue as well that the master's degree is becoming the new bachelor's degree. And what I mean by that is that you know, the, match, the master's degree is what the bachelor's degree was say 30 or 40 years ago, where many people have them, people are getting them younger and younger, and more and more people are coming to us and saying, you know, I already have a master's degree. What do I do next? What's, what's my next step to, to set myself apart? People are getting master's degrees younger and younger. There's a lot of fifth year masters. We're rolling them out at Penn State. They're rolling out all over the country where, where students will roll right from an undergraduate degree into a master's program. So the master's is kind of the new bachelor's in many ways. Um, so what, what options do you have post master's as well? For many people, it's picking up a second master's. Uh, we, we see the, the general MBA coupled with a specialty master's um, being a popular combination. For others, it might be more of an executive doctoral program as well. Um, we're getting more inquiries into that type of program. So again, one size doesn't fit all, but it's something to think about. Um, that, you know, we're, we have an increasingly highly educated workforce, and what do you do to, to um, continue to set yourself apart in that workforce? Some other general trends in education. 
more demand for personalized education. So I, I like to say the days of the static cohorted program where everybody takes the same thing from start to finish, no electives, you know, the, just a real rigid design to the program. Uh, I like to say those days are over. They're at least over um, uh, uh, in our college. More, uh, especially the Gen Zers, if you look at the, the research around Gen Zers, and I would say this is just everybody today, not necessarily just Gen Zers, people want to be able to craft at least part of the degree and to, to, to meet their interests and career goals. One size doesn't fit all. So if you're looking for a longer term program, like a master's degree, do you have the ability to pick elective areas and, uh, and other areas to kind of craft around where you want to go? Or are you forced to take the same program from start to finish as everybody else? So definitely, if you look at all the, the research out there and education trends, more demand for personal personalization of the curriculum and individual individualized curriculum is uh, an increasing trend. Convergence between resident and online education. I like to say the traditional lines where residents over here and online's over there is gone. It's everything in between and hybrid education and what mixture of resident and online makes sense for the audience. Um, so it's a, th these traditional boundaries just don't make sense any longer. Um, it, even within online, there's a lot of uh, differences between a totally asynchronous online experience where you know you only really interact with the instructor via videos and maybe emails and chats versus a, a more hybrid synchronous experience where you have live sessions with the instructor you get to know them and interact with the students and the instructor in synchronous time and and we the technologies are very good just like the technology we're using now to do this uh, which is our model at penn state we want you to have a meaningful educational experience and really get to know the experts in the field that have designed and are teaching the classes and not just watch them on videos. So that's our mantra at Penn State, but it's not the, the situation everywhere. Um, shorter market focused experiences. So the, the whole uh, topic of what uh, is generally called micro credentials is popular today. I'm actually doing a session this Thursday afternoon for the MBA roundtable on micro credentials and our degree stacking model um, in the Smeal College of Business and how we allow you to stack certificates to matriculate into degrees and other things like that if anybody's interested. And that's uh, through the MBA roundtable uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, but this is a definite trend. Uh, and, and I would say shorter micro credentials that, that need to build towards a larger credential so that you're not just taking a short micro credential and that's as far as you can go there's nothing else you can do with it afterwards or apply it to anything i i i i think you need to look at you know where what could i do with this afterwards if i want to uh, all of this requires more guidance and counseling on the part of the educational provider so this is a question you should ask you know are they starting the discussion with let us tell you about your uh, our programs or are they starting the discussion with what do you want to do with your career what are your career goals and we'll help you build a, a learning program, a, a learning path to get you there. Very different ways of looking at things. Uh, increasing rate of change, need for lifelong engagement, lifelong and lear learning with the partner. You know, uh, I think it goes without saying that the rate of change was great before the pandemic. I would argue the pandemic has accelerated trends, all, all of these trends, a good five to seven years ahead of where they would have been otherwise. So people are looking for you know, a lifelong learning partner in many cases. So how can what I do now build and take me into other degrees and, and a, perhaps an accelerated and cheaper format? We At Penn State, we call this concurrent degrees where you can apply some of the coursework that overlaps between one degree and another, and we provide you with quicker and cheaper paths to earn multiple degrees. And I, I think that's a, a definite trend for the future. Um, bachelor's and new masters, talked about that already. That's a definite trend. Degree isn't always the answer. Uh, sometimes a micro-credential certificate of some type is just what you need to get to the next step in your career. So I don't, I don't wanna give the impression that the degree is always the, the way to go. Again, one size does not fit all. And work no longer ends uh, at 65 or retirement. Um, learning goes on throughout your life. So are there ways to stay engaged and learn and keep updated in your field um, it, when you might be either retired or partially retired or in the gig economy that we all read about today where you're doing 
different um, jobs as an independent consultant uh, still need uh, some type of lifelong learning opportunities. Now, apologize for the small font. Wanted to try to get everything on one slide. A lot of things to think about when you're choosing uh, an educational partner, whether it's a for-profit or, or university or college-based training. Um, just a, it, these are a few things, I'll go through them quickly, but it's not just kind of sign, it shouldn't be just signing up and taking the program. It, you should really check into all the different services and, and, and larger uh, offerings that are available through, through your training or education partner. So the reputation and quality, if you're looking at degrees, are they accredited? Uh, quality of the faculty and staff resources and expertise and the type of program and the, the way it's being delivered. Um, you know, if it's somebody that's just starting up and online, you know, probably not going to have as much expertise uh, in the delivery mechanisms and the pedagogies as somebody that's been doing it for a while. Um, how is the program going to fit your specific needs and career goals? Um, are you going to need time off? Um, is it a flexible program that allows you to take time off? If things start getting crazy in your lives, if you're doing this while you're working, um, what if you have to slow down and take fewer classes? Uh, are you able to do that? Uh, can I add a concentration? Can I change my mind? Uh, if I decide after taking a few classes, this isn't what I want to do, can I apply those classes to another degree or another program? Uh, so how much flexibility do you have? Um, if your job changes, you know, will they work with you to uh, slow down the curriculum or, or allow you to take time off. Same if you're moving, what are your options? So how flexible is the, the provider? Uh, what are the provider's capabilities to innovate and keep up with the increasing rate of change with technology and the way courses are delivered with pedagogies, et cetera? So, you know, ask some questions. Uh, do you just put your courses out and don't look at them again for another 10 years? Or are you going through some kind of continuous improvement process internally where you're improving the courses, maybe do major redesigns every now and then as um, you know, hopefully you know, every three, four or five years or so uh, to, to account for changes in technologies, uh, changes in pedagogy, et cetera. So what's the philosophy around continuous improvement uh, within the courses that you offer? Um, what else do you have available beside the, the, the course of the program you're taking? Um, and what might I be, might be able to combine together or progress into. Like I said, for lifelong learning, you might want to, if you start with a, a degree earlier in your career, what can I do to build upon that and maybe matriculate into other degrees as I uh, progress in my career? And this is what we call concurrent degrees at Penn State or degree stacking. You'll hear that term used quite a bit. Um, personalized learning outside of the classroom, what kind of program support? So th this all gets into what, what type of student services, student communities, and also alumni support and alumni communities uh, is the goal lifelong engagement. This is our mantra at Penn State. Um, if so, what happens after I finish? Um, is it a thank you, uh, you know, let us know if you have questions or do you have opportunities for me to engage as, as uh, an alumni of your program and continued learning opportunities, network opportunities and et cetera um and what happens after graduation as well for career advice uh do you have postgraduate uh career development opportunities um you know a, a lot of things that you should be thinking about and um as i said we're building all of this and have all of this in place at penn state but there, there are things you need to think about if your goal is really to stay engaged and continue learning after your initial degree is done and i think that's all i'm going to say on this slide So some of the certificates and degrees that we have at Penn State that might be of interest to this audience. We have many more than this, but I'm just pointing out some that um, just from our past experience have been attractive to the business analyst and business architecture communities. Uh, these are all online, can be taken anywhere in the world, um, but online with a lot of, like I said, integration and interaction and, and uh, synchronous opportunities to uh, really create that community with the, the faculty and the, the students in the programs. So we have an online business, uh, Master's of Business Administration. For those of you that might be more in the, in the business side of, of um, uh, business architecture, we have an online Master's in Enterprise Architecture and Business Transformation. 
this might be an option for those of you that are more on the technical side. And there are business architects that come from more of a technical background and want to stay and work in an enterprise architecture related uh, area. We also have a master's in corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. I put this in here because in a few organizations, I actually see business architecture rolling up to a chief innovation officer, which I think is a very innovative model. Um, if you think about business architects, they, they are in a position or should be in a position to have a unique vantage point in an organization and connect dots in ways that, that really no other group um, can connect or, or, or has access to. So for that reason, I'm seeing business architecture really um, resonate well with chief innovation officers if you have that role in your organization. So that might be another path. Again, and again, there's what's nice about business architecture, there's so many different ways you can go from more of a business focus to more of a technical focus to more of an innovation focus. <clears throat> Excuse me, two other programs that might be of interest. We have a master's in data analytics for those of you that might gravitate more towards the data analytics side. And this, that's a rapidly growing area in most organizations. And we also have a master's in project management for those of you that might really gravitate toward more towards the PMO office uh, type responsibilities. So those are some popular master's programs. And again, we have many more than this, but these are just highlighting a few that, that are typically of interest to this audience. We also have a number of graduate certificates. These are anywhere from nine credits to 12 credits. So three courses or four courses in length. And the, the nice thing about our model at Penn State, these graduate certificates for, for the most part, all of them, uh, or most of them, not every single one of them, but most of them will allow you to matriculate into these different master's programs. So for example, you could start with a graduate certificate in business analytics, thinking you may wanna do the data analytics master's program, but then after you're in it, you decide, no, nope, I'd rather do the online MBA. You can do it, no problem. Th those courses matriculate in, into the, that master's program. And the, the way we do this, all of these master's programs have elective areas. And most of our concentrations are elective areas in our master's program, so it makes for uh, a nice way to offer multiple matriculation paths if you really aren't sure what master's program or if you wanna do a master's program. We also have a graduate certificate in business architecture. To my knowledge, the only online graduate certificate in business architecture in the country. Uh, we also have an online graduate certificate in enterprise architecture. We have an online grad certificate in corporate innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as management consulting, project management, marketing analytics, negotiation and influence, strategic leadership and business sustainability strategy. So a lot of uh, certificates to choose from. And this is just a subset of our overall portfolio of certificates. These are just the cer certificates that typically resonate well with, with this audience. Um, this is our current portfolio and we're, we're uh, planning on, uh, on launching a number of new programs besides the ones that, that you see here. But this is our current portfolio at Penn State with our resident programs. Most of these are one year, fifth year programs, uh, typically targeting people with zero to um, three years uh, work experience. So these, this is mostly early career, except for our two year MBA, which is a, a, you know, a more senior level um, program. Our executive MBA is also a very senior level program, average of 10 plus years experience. And we run that out of the Philadelphia region for any of you that might be living in the Philadelphia region. And then the rest of the programs listed here besides the MBA programs are fifth year programs targeting a younger audience. Now our online programs on the other hand target a mid and senior level working audience. They're online, people literally from all over the globe taking these programs. I won't go through each topic but this shows you some of the uh, choices you have uh, within our online masters and related online grad certificates. So this is the full list of online graduate certificates that we offer in this new college of business. And as I said, we use the certificates as the bridge between the master's programs. So most uh, all of these certificates are used as concentration areas in the online master's programs so that you can take a certificate and matriculate into you know, many different master's programs uh, depending on uh, where you'd like to go with your, your career. And we use the, you see the Legos here. We, we use the um, analogy that we have a lot of Lego pieces and we can put them together in whatever fashion um, it meets your needs and your career goals. I mentioned degree stacking earlier. Um, if this is a new term for you, I thought I'd just spend a few minutes on it. 
very popular today, We're seeing a lot of interest in this from our students. Uh, and I mentioned this before, this at Penn State, we call this a concurrent degree, where we give you a path to get uh, multiple master's degrees in a faster and cheaper fashion than if you try to get each degree separately. And this is definitely becoming a trend in, in education today. Uh, some other examples of innovations within our portfolio. I mentioned the integration between our programs and, and the Lego pieces that you can build together and it changes the conversation uh, to more of a consultative approach on where you'd like to go with your um, career and your educational journey. And then we help you put together the pieces to get you there. We have a, a great student services shared across the portfolio that allows us to offer services to the community in a, in a way that uh, you couldn't do if the programs were more siloed and, and non-integrated. Um, we also have a scaling model that we use in our online courses where we actually bring in graduates of the program that are working in the field as teaching support specialists to help with um, the learning experience. So they bring in a lot of real world experience. They actively participate in the classes and it's a, it's a unique model that's really received well by the, the students. And some other optional things. Um, within our portfolio, any of our students can go on a global immersion. We typically have four different locations around the, the world. Totally optional. If you want to go, you can go. If you don't want to go, you don't, don't have to go. And what I find with every audience, again, one size doesn't fit all. There might be a few people that really want to go on the global immersion and other people that want nothing to do with it. That's great. Um, I'm a big believer in providing options. So for the people that really want to do it, here's how you do it. If you don't want to do it, it's not a required part of your program and you don't have to do it. Also optional campus experiences. This the, We find with our online populations in particular, again, some people really want to come to campus. They want an opportunity to come to campus, meet the dean, participate in some on-campus experiences, even go to a tailgate and a football game if they, if they want to. But then there's another segment of the online populations that either doesn't want to or can't get to campus. Uh, and they don't want any requirements to be on campus. They want to be able to do everything fully remotely if they want to. So we're, we're providing something for everybody. Optional experiences on campus once a year where you can come in, participate in optional leadership immersion experiences, meet the dean, attend a tailgate, attend a football game and, and other things and attend some on-campus educational sessions if you want to. If you don't want to or can't, um, you're not required. So again, one size doesn't fit all. And we're looking at um, building out a range of alumni career services and online communities and engagement portals for our students after they graduate. And we're just in the early stages of building some of those services out. This is a graphic that attempts to illustrate our lifelong learning portfolio. And you can see we almost have a cradle to grave um, portfolio. We have very early career programs, a lot for the mid career and, and uh, into the senior career level. Um, we're looking at possibly, um, we're ex uh, exploring a possible doctorate of business administration. It's not official yet, but we're talking about it uh, internally. If we went forward with that program, that would be at the very senior level as well. And then the grad certificates here can be layered in at any point along the way. Um, that's the, the purpose of listing the grad certificates above and below the, the degree programs. They can be layered in anywhere along the way as, as you need them throughout your educational journey. So I would like to stop here um, about right where I want to be and allow you know 15 minutes or so for uh, questions and answer and discussion. If you have any more questions um, about our programs, you can visit this website. It'll talk about the programs that I have listed here um, or, or please drop me a line. So any questions from anybody? Thanks, Brian. I, I think a lot of our audience learned a lot about how they can learn, upscale, or pivot into a meaningful career. I have a lot of questions coming in in the questions box. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, do any other universities offer, offer programs in business architecture? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, uh, um, not in the United States and Canada for the. Uh, there, there might be a few in Europe and in New Zealand, but not, and I don't believe those programs are online. So as far as I know, we are the only um, university offering online programs in business architecture today. And we're the only one still that has an online master's in enterprise architecture. Um, 
a few, uh, I think one university in Australia and, and there might be one in Europe as well that do resident masters in enterprise architecture, but we're the only one offering an online masters uh, in the world today. I'll move to the next question from Catherine. Uh, how do you move up when due to company mergers or sales affect your position? The path you are in is no longer possible and your best option is potentially to leave the company. That, that happens a lot nowadays with mergers, acquisitions. Um, I, you know, I'll tell you what I tell my students and what I tell my own children. Um, the, the, the better um, you can make yourself as a package and think about how you're going to sell yourself to the next employer, and that's education, experience, et cetera. Uh, I think we all nowadays need to prepare ourselves for that type of situation. Uh, you know, the, the days of working for one employer for most of your career, we tell our students in their lifetime, they're likely going to have 10 or 12 different employers, um, you know, m m maybe more. Um, so you, you've got to really think about how you're packaging yourself um, to, to market yourself to other potential employers with education, experience, et cetera. So I, I, I think the only way to that I can think of to, to adequately answer that question is, is make yourself ready so that if that happens to you, you're, you're re you don't miss a beat. Uh, another important, so besides having, you know, a, a, a good um, ed, ed, educational portfolio on your resume and a good set of experiences, please don't underestimate the power of the network. And I, I probably don't need to tell you folks this, but I saw a study oh, a few years ago, something like 80% of jobs that you see posted on average, um, the, the organization already has a good idea of who they want. And that all comes through networking. And I know from my own experience, if a really good employee recommends a colleague, that means something to me because I, I, I really value that person and their judgment. So do not underestimate the power of your network and networking. Uh, keep your network up, keep your contacts up. Um, I, it always amazes me how somebody I met years and years ago, uh, and at the time you didn't think that person you know, would, would uh, be able to help you in any way. But years later, through different twists and turns, that person leads you to a contact that leads you to an opportunity. Uh, so don't, don't underestimate any of your relationships, uh, keep them healthy, and I think you'll be surprised where, where a good network can, can take you. Thanks, Brian. I think that brings up a lot of good points about how you can kind of package yourself as an employee or a potential employee too. And to your point, don't underestimate your network. And don't wait until what happens. Uh, I've seen some people that come to us, I just got laid off or I just went through a merger. Okay, I wanna start your degree program now. That, that's fine, but I, I prefer to see people that have already thought about this might happen to me someday. So I'm getting the education now, I'm getting everything in line now. So if it does happen, I'm ready, rather than waiting till it does happen to you. So that's another piece of advice I would give you. you know, be, be proactive. Oh, I think that speaks really well to your points about lifelong learning. It's not something you do at one point in your career. It's something that you have to build and continue to work on. So I'll move to Teresa. Uh, now she kind of has three questions for you. I'll, I'll say all three of them in one go because I think they're very much connected. Uh, what about uh, non-traditional college students? How do you see the concept of career changing and career trend changes? As you said, it's not one size fits all. How do you suggest evaluating the impact of a degree or a certificate in a combination? And most of our students, so oh, oh, over half of our portfolio, well, three quarters of our portfolio uh, focuses on the non-traditional student. So except for our one-year programs, everybody's working uh, at different levels. And we've have all levels of people from a wide variety of industries. Um, and one size doesn't fit all. Um, I, I think the, the biggest challenge that I see for most people is figuring out where they want to go. Uh, we actually are developing a course now that'll be an elective to all of our uh, online students and helping you figure that out. This is such a need today. So we'll have career coaches and uh, et cetera in the course, and we'll have a, a course, an elective course you can take to, to kind of develop your own career path or your career plan might be a better way of saying it. Uh, so it's, it's tough to figure it uh, out for many people. I, I, I've had people, so I teach a strategic business 
architecture course. It's the only one like it in, in the country. And it focuses on business architecture as a facilitator of strategy execution is more of a strategic role in the company. And what does that look like? And how do you kind of get it there in an organization? And I have people that took it as an elective because it sounded interesting, but they really didn't know that much about it, that feel they found their life's calling because it just, this, this is what I want to do. And I, I think that's part of the educational journey is to try different things. And you'll quickly uh, see where your interests and skills lead you and what you gravitate towards. I have some people that have walked out of certain courses and say, Ooh, okay, I'm nice to know that, but not what I want to do as a career. So I, I think if you're not sure, trying different things, try, trying different certificates, different paths, and then hopefully something just clicks with you that you find your calling and then you know move forward in that direction but um uh, yeah I, I, that's the best advice i can give you right now is um you know try different things and and it's really gratifying for me when i see where somebody found their calling uh at, when it happens in one of my courses and this is what they want to do with their lives uh because they for a long time you know and these people might be mid-career kind of you know wondering from uh not really feeling they found what they really want to do and then they, they find then they finally find it but it takes some people you know quite a while many years to to figure that out that's a great answer i'll i'll move on to eve uh asking about the difference between business architecture and enterprise architecture is, is there a quick answer you can give to that i know that's a bit loaded <laughs> that's a loaded question all right <laughs> I'm going to give you my answer, okay? And uh, if there's any enterprise architects in the group, um, I'm sure you're going to argue with me. Um, we actually start this in my strategic business architecture class. This is how I start the class. Uh, what is enterprise architecture? What's business architecture? And let's talk about different perspectives and definitions. Because again, yeah, you, you ask 10 different people, you're going to get 10 different answers on this. Okay. The traditional uh, high-level definition of business architecture is a domain within enterprise architecture. So if you look at your traditional, what many people call the bait model, where you have business architecture, you have application architecture, data and information architecture, and then technology or inf infrastructure architecture. And those are the four pillars, traditional pillars of enterprise architecture. And in that world, if enterprise architecture reports to the CIO, then typically the BA group is more of the you know, IT process modelers and IT capability modelers. Not in every organization, and so I'm generalizing, generalizing things. Uh, that's kind of where things grew up, but that's not where things are today in many organizations. I, I think, uh, you know, having come from enterprise architecture, I can say this, in many organizations, the enterprise architecture group has failed to become that enterprise-wide strategic resource. It's, it's more of the IT planning um, group. And not in every organization, but in many. So in those organizations, uh, business architecture has kind of evolved or moved away from enterprise architecture, perhaps under a business function like strategic planning. Uh, so in those organizations, business architecture is more of a facilitator of strategy execution and a, and a, a function that informs business strategy. That's really, I think, the the promise of business architecture for many organizations is the facilitation of strategy execution and informing a business strategy. Um, but that's not the case in every organization. Like I said, there's uh, if you look at some of the statistics um, from the Business Architecture Guild and others, uh, they'll tell you about 60% of BA groups, according to, to the Business Architecture Guild, fall into that business function reporting. And about 40% are under traditional enterprise architecture, which is under IT. It used to be more like it, th those stats used to be flipped, where 60% under EA, then it was 50 50 for a while. Now the trend is more 60 40. Um, so, th th you know, that's um, a high level view of the different perspectives and different positions where you might see business architecture and how it relates to enterprise architecture. Um, I've only seen, so if an EA group has made the transition to being a strategic resource, which honestly, in my career, I've only seen two, maybe three that fall into that category where they work hand in hand with strategic planning. They sit on the investment boards for the corporation and no major investments made without EA's uh, uh, input. 
if you're there, then I would say it makes sense. Then business architecture is probably more of a strategic resource. If you're not there, which I think is the case in, in most organizations, like I said, I've only encountered two, maybe three that fall into the more strategic realm. Um, then uh, business architecture is probably not the, you know, it's more of a, 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 pro, a modeling function for the IT group. So I think that's a fantastic answer to a, a very big question. And we could have a whole webinar, I think, just on that topic. So thanks again for covering something that's very yeah, big. Yeah, it's a question I've been discussing and debating with many for many, many years. So that's where, I, this is how I've arrived at these, uh, th th these perspectives. <laughs> Great summary. I'll, I'll move on to Brad. He has an MBA. Is it possible to apply those credits towards another master's degree? Uh, the short answer at most universities is no. Um, once a degree is conferred at, at most reputable universities, uh, you can't uh, reuse those credits. So when I talk about concurrent degrees, that's why you're in the program. You, you express your interest in picking up the second degree, your degree plan is approved, and then you can apply the credits towards a second degree. But you can't come back, you know, say five years later, and try to apply those credits. It, it, it doesn't work that way uh, uh, for accreditation purposes and other purposes. Now you you know you will see some lower tier uh, schools and 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 others in the space that will give you credit for experience or prior um, degrees. Um, we don't do that, and nobody in the Big Ten does that, um, or, or uh, at least not that I'm aware of. So I would really look at the quality of the institution if they're saying, yeah, we'll knock off half of the degree because you already have an MBA. Is that the degree you want on, on your transcripts? Um, I'm not saying it is or isn't. I would just ask that question. Good question to ask. Uh, I'll move on to a question from Jackie. I think you touched on this a bit earlier in your presentation. How can a BA become a C-level officer, like a COO? Which educational package would be helpful? I know you mentioned maybe uh, business architecture as chief innovation officer as an option, but that doesn't touch really on the educational package. Okay, uh, my opinion, and I have students doing this now. So if business architecture is um, an interest area of yours, um, I'm, I'm just talking about from the perspective of our programs. Uh, I would do the business architecture concentration in our online MBA program, uh, depending on where you are in your career. Now, it, it, if you're um, if you're you know mid level or so, I think that's a good path. Um, business architecture concentration in the online MBA, and I have some students uh, as part of the first assignment in my class. I have them seek out who does strategic planning in their organizations, and I have students that actually have received job offers to join the strategic planning group just because they have some idea of the, the issues around strategy execution. So that, that's a good path. Now, if you're a more senior level person, maybe you already have an MBA and you're looking at what, what do I do next? Maybe you got your MBA 10 years ago, something like that. We have a more senior level program. Uh, it's a master's in strategic management and executive leadership. And you can do a business architecture concentration there as well. Um, and this program is for people that are typically at 10 years and up uh, in experience. I think the average is about 15, 17 years work experience. So these are people that oftentimes got a degree earlier in their career, maybe got the general business either through an MBA or some other a mechanism and really want to focus on strategy and executive leadership. So those are two options we have in our portfolio. Thanks, Brian. I'll move on to, I, I think this can be answered quickly from Ezekiel. Is business architecture offered at the doctorate level at Penn State's New College of Business? Ah, I get this one a lot as well. Um, not yet. So, and, and again, this may or may not happen. So don't quote me on this. We have discussions internally. You see um, a number of universities launching executive doctorate in business administration. So an executive DBA. Um, these um, programs are for senior level working professionals and, and are structured to be able to be done while you're working. You know, you, you, you might fly in once a semester for an extended weekend and a lot of synchronous uh, remote education and discussions. Um, you're, you're seeing many schools launch these today. We're discussing one. OK, so the decision hasn't been made to do it by any means. But as part of that design, 
if, if, the, if this is the design of the program um, as it goes forward, you would be able to um, take business architecture as one of the concentration areas through our graduate certificates, and then work with one of our faculty members, perhaps uh, me, on a thesis related to you know, a, a research topic in business architecture. Again, I'll, we have a lot of work to do before that's gonna become a reality. The earliest we would launch something like this, if we did, it would be fall 23. So if you're interested in this, you know, send me an email offline. I will keep you apprised as things uh, evolve with the discussions. Uh, we're still in mid-discussion right now on whether we're gonna pursue a program like this. Um, but that would be the, the closest thing uh, possible that I've seen anywhere to, to, to fitting either business architecture or enterprise architecture into uh, a professional doctorate studies program. Thanks, Brian. I'll move on to a question I think will be relevant for a lot of people from Hassam. Uh, in his example, he's in France and already has a master's in engineering degree in an industrial field in big data, and he's interested in becoming a business architect what would be the best degree for him for a certificate and does he need to stop working for that so the aspect i think might be relevant for a lot of people is do you need to stop working when you already have experience like this oh no and none of our uh programs all of our online programs are designed for working professionals from all over the globe so no you definitely do not need to stop working in today's world uh, uh you get now depending on your work schedule some people will take two classes a semester some will take one, some may even go up to three. Um, you know, depending on how many you're able to fit into your, your, your life um, will uh, dictate how quickly you progress through the program. But no, definitely don't, don't have to quit working and hopefully your employer provides educational benefits. Almost all of our students are um, having their employers contribute all or most of the, the cost of the degree. Um, as far as so somebody with a more technical background, uh, you're likely lacking in the business uh, area and to, really to get into more strategy related areas and be taken seriously. You got to be able to speak the language and understand the language of business at least as well or better than your technical discipline. Uh, that's just an, a, a fact in all organizations today. If you're really going to you know, break into more of a business related strategy related role. So I, if you don't have the general business background, which I didn't hear you say that uh, in your overview, then I would consider the online MBA with a business architecture concentration. That will give you the, a, a great educational foundation that will enable you then to, 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 to make that leap. Thanks, Brian. It was engineering degree and big data. So yeah, I think, I think you're right about the business aspect of it as well. I'll move on to Mambir, and I apologize, I'll, I'll summarize it a little bit and paraphrase, but um, for Brian, does Penn State uh, kind of do anything to keep up with uh, modern trends? So what has Penn State done with their education program to kind of adjust into the new trends and what has happened since the pandemic? Uh, very good question. This is actually, a, you watched my slides. This is actually a question I said you should ask your educational provider. So uh, kudos to you to, to ask me the, the question. Uh, so uh, a number of things, two in particular. Uh, we have a unique role that, that focuses just on our graduate portfolio, our director of uh, teaching and learning excellence, um, at Dr. Janet Duck. And she's constantly looking at new trends, new technologies, new ways of doing things. So we have somebody that's focused on this as part of their job. And I haven't seen that at any other university. You know, everybody will say, yeah, we keep up with trends. Of course we do. But ask them, well, give me an example, show me how. Uh, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, and we've done that. We, we've hired a, a, a role because there's so much to this and the world's changing so fast that somebody that's just focused on the, the student experience and improving the, the portfolio over time. It's more of a continuous improvement mindset. And, and Janet's not by herself. We do this as a team. You know, we're on, uh, you know, uh, me in particular, I'm on a number of uh, boards nationwide and we look at trends, talk about trends. So we bring all these data points that we're seeing in the marketplace. We bring it back, discuss it as a team. And then Janet's the person then to do the experimentation and implementation. And if you don't have that dedicated role, often these things don't go further than just the discussion phase because somebody needs the, the, the expertise and the bandwidth to implement. So that's one thing we're doing and have been doing. Uh, a second thing that we're uh, putting together now, 
we're putting together a, a board of people, uh, an advisory board for our portfolio. And this is unlike any advisory board I've seen anywhere in the, in, in the country. Most advisory boards at universities, some of you may be on some, uh, uh, are consist of alumni who are well-meaning, very nice people, but they always think about the way things were when they were in the program. They're not really they're not really knowledgeable or able to talk about where education needs to go in the future. So we don't want to put together one of those types of boards. That's the typical board that you see at most universities. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to put together a board of leading thinkers in professional graduate education, particularly at the mid and senior level. And where's education going? And and this is, uh, I like to think of this as our R&D board. So of all the different things we could try, what, what are the things we should be trying, experimenting with, and, and help us kind of down select where we spend our time and efforts. So we've got some really great people. We're just putting this together now with um, one of our board of visitors members who's a real forward looking thinker. And we've got a group of people that are just fabulous. Um, so they're gonna they're gonna continue to challenge us to stay leading edge and help us think about where things are going, you know, in the next five to ten years. So we're there when the time comes, and we're not uh, kind of sitting around and wondering who moved my cheese, like you see it in many other organizations where they're kind of playing catch up. Uh, we want to be the person that people are catching up to, not the people playing catch up. Exactly, and that only makes the degree more worthwhile or those micro uh, educations that these people get so that they can move exactly. forward in their career. Mm -hmm. yep. and, so and we'd be looking we, at we are a little short on time now. Sorry, I just wanted to mention that. Oh, okay, I'm happy to do a few more <laughs> questions if you want. Okay, well, I just want to make sure that uh, we're, we're aware of everybody's time, but yes, we'll, we'll leave it at one last question then. But uh, for everybody who can't stick around for that one, I understand. So we'll leave it at our last question from Lars. Uh, just to cover off uh, those micro-credentials that you talked about, uh, what defines quality regarding a micro-credential for Penn State? And which accreditation institution is your micro-credential registered with? Oh, okay, well, for all uh, business schools, AACSB is the, accredit the international accrediting body for business schools. So that, that's a question you should ask if you're looking at a, a degree or any other type of credential coming from a, a college or university uh, from a business school. Are you AACSB accredited? If the answer is no, then um, you know, I'd, I'd look a little more skeptically at that, uh, that particular institution uh, because they haven't um, shown that their business programs meet the criteria for this international accrediting body. And that, that, that is the accreditation and business school spaces, AACSB. There are other regional accreditations that smaller schools will get, at least in the United States. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're fine, but they're typically more general, um, you know, and, and that the school does certain things. If you're really looking at who's really looking at the quality of the business program you're putting out, it's AACSB. And there's really no other accrediting body that, uh, to, that, that is what is internationally recognized uh, as AACSB is. Quality can make a big difference. Uh, I think that's the last, we're already three minutes over, but thank you, Brian, for your time on that one. And you gave a lot of great insights here. I already see a, a lot of thank yous to the people that we were able to get to for answers. And thank you to you for your time, Brian. Uh, are there any final words you'd like to give to our audience? No, I uh, appreciate all the questions and interest and uh, feel free to contact me if, um, if you have any additional questions. Then I'll say thank you to everybody here for being with us and we'll see you next time.